Happy Akadashi to everyone out there. Uh, thank you so much again for coming and spending some time with us to hear about and to relish uh, all the ways in which Srila Prabhupada exemplifies the perfect gentleman uh, through the 26 qualities of a devotee. So again, I'm very, very happy to be with my friend Siddhanta Prabhu, who has uh, given so much of his life to, to bringing these uh, these qualities to us through the memories, through the through the lens, through the eyes of us, his disciples who had the fortune of being with him in different times and places. So, Siddhanta, today I believe we are going to be hearing about the quality of not eating more than is required. Right, quality. Is that right? The quality number seventeen. 17. A perfect, a perfect gentleman or a Vaishnav, does not eat more than required. Mm. Now, you know, usually what comes to mind when we hear this quality that we think that, that this applies only to the quantity that yeah. the devotee or Vaishnav eats. But today we'll explore some other factors, some other facets, like the type of prasadam, type of food that we eat, or the mm -hmm. devotee eats, mm -hmm. the circumstances in which we find ourselves eating prasadam. Yeah. And this will be explored by, of course, again, listening to Prabhupada's disciples who were with him during these times. We have uh, about half and half men and women that will share their stories and experience personal experiences with Prabhupada. So today we will hear from Jamuna, Devi Dasi. Jamuna must Sh hear from Jamuna. <laughs> exactly. On this topic. Shruti Rupa, Devi Dasi, who yes. was Prabhupada's cook Another. for several years. Yes. Jai Pataka Swami. Tamal okay. Krishna Goswami, Rebati Nandan, and Sarva Mangala Devi Dasi. Oh, wonderful. Wonderful. So let's jump right into it. And first, let's hear from Jamuna, who is one of the leaders, if not the leader, when it comes to cooking prasadam, yeah, yeah. as instructed by Srila Prabhupada. Yeah. And in this particular story, she will give us an example of the amount of prasadam okay. that okay. Srila Prabhupada ate at one point, and more importantly, the type of prasadam required to capture us and turn us into bhaktas. Mm. <laughs> Very essential. So let's hear from Jamun Devi Dasi. Srila Prabhupada liked anything that was well prepared. He tried to teach us technique, procedure, quality, cleanliness, purity, in simple ways. He didn't teach um, with a lot of words, he teached by example. And of course, he had uh, personal favorites. At this time, Srila Prabhupada was, uh, had a little tummy, and he was eating immense quantities of rice. Sometimes we would feed a very large tali, and he would finish off most of that tali, leave a little maha for us. But um, the things that he taught us were generally fatty and juicy and sweet and succulent and, and very sumptuous. That was the era of sumptuous prasad. Because he felt if he could catch us through the tongue, tongue doing two things, vibrating and respecting, if he could capture us through those two ways, then we would begin to taste more and more of Krishna consciousness. So the food was sumptuous and rich. Yeah, what we were just reflecting, you know, required, you know, the term required, required for what? So here the requirement is to get us to to be become attached to Krishna. Yeah. And through a, prashadam. Always uh, concerned that the quality of the prashadam was first yeah. class. Yes. Several, many instances where Prabhupada always asked, even if he couldn't eat, if he was sick at one time, he would ask, how are the devotees eating? Yeah. What are they yeah. eating? Yeah. And um, sometimes he would chastise the cook. Actually, he forced the devotees to throw a cook out in India. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. That's another story. But um, yeah, so that's the that's the prime benefit and motivation and reason for good prasadam to make devotees and keep devotees. Yes, yes. So now let's listen to Shruti Rupa, Devi Dasi, who cooked, as I said, for Prabhupada for several years there yeah, towards the end. Yeah. And uh, she will give us an example of what was required for Srila Prabhupada at a time when his health was not at an optimum. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the cooking early on, um, she was cooking, she used a lot of, so she wasn't using the mustard oil, but she would use a lot of mustard seeds and grind them to a paste, and that would bring out a flavor of mustard. So after maybe two weeks of this, Prabhupada would, he started swelling. He was complaining to me, um, don't let her make this, don't let her make that. And then I, would, was, tr I was trying to taper her off. Pishma, you can't do this, Pishma, you can't. And so then w about the third day, because at least if she didn't grind them, she started putting them, they were floating on everything. And, and the, the third day Prabhupada had, he looked at me and said, do not let her in the kitchen. Do not let her back in the kitchen. And I did not have the heart to tell her she couldn't come in the kitchen. I loved her dearly. And she adored Prabhupada. And so next morning when it was time to come in, there's Pishima and you know, we came in, we'd sit down in a little circle. It was like a little ritual. We would begin and a lot of it was eyes, body language and feelings and the few little words that I would do. And she'd have her foot knife and we'd begin and she had a stone. We had to grind everything. Prabhupada wanted everything fresh. Uh, I would take an extra hour and a half in the morning and grind cumin, grind, you know, but at that time he was taking wet, wet paste. It wasn't dry. I would grind with water. And I'd grind on the stone, silbata, and so I'd have all my katoris of a ginger paste, chili paste, black pepper paste, and cumin, and um, right on down the line, mustard seeds, posta. And <clears throat> so we were grinding, and Pishma was getting her vegetables together, and she asked me for the sarsal. In Bengali, it's mustard seeds. And I looked and I said, Pishima Prabhupada Bolo Ne, Ne Sarsal. And she'd look at me and I'd say, and she had these big cow eyes, and she'd look at me, and, and I, I could hardly resist her. And so I, I, t I went into my katori and I took one seed, one seed, and I looked and I said, Pishima, bus. And she looked at me. She couldn't believe I was being so cruel. But she took that. We started laughing. She was smiling. She took that one seed and threw a little water and began to grind. And if you know what the stone looks like, it has pits, you know, to grind. So I don't know where she got. And she was going like this, and she got it. And we were laughing. And somewhere or other, she got something that she could put in there. <laughs> that is a real Leela. <laughs> Pishima's cooking. There, uh, you could you could do a whole series on Prishima's cooking for Srila Prabhupada and and the, the the different times and situations where sometimes it was no one could understand. <laughs> they had that relationship. Yeah, yeah. but uh, at that time, uh, mustard seeds were not required, so not Prabhupada required. could not eat no. more than that one seed. <laughs> one seed. <laughs> But she required it. She, <laughs> she, did, yeah. it. she was attached to cooking that way. Samosas, kachoris for Prabhupada. For service. For service. All right. Out of love. Um, now, let us listen to a unique, a unique story by Jai Pataka Swami. Uh -huh. How Srila Prabhupada explained what is required to eat if the need to drink water arises immediately after a meal. Okay. So this will fall into that category of not eating more than required. Prabhupada will give us a, a scientific method that uh, we can take to heart and learn for ourselves. Sometimes we would, uh, I'd had the good fortune to ride with Srila Prabhupada from Calcutta. And sometimes I'd be here in my emperor waiting for him to come. So on one occasion, uh, there's a whole caravan of cars and we're going out from Calcutta, and there's a little place, a little mango orchard. It used to be a big mango orchard, but what's left of it now is still there. A little piece was purchased by a devotee. 
And that was always Srila Prabhupada's favorite picnic spot. Every time he would uh, stop there and have his breakfast, uh, leave early in the morning, stop and have a breakfast picnic. So on the way driving out, there was an interesting uh, pastime that Prabhupada had the Christian Balaram on the windshield of the uh, car. And so he asked the devotees, well, who is more powerful, Krishna or Balaram? And then uh, some said, well, Balaram, he's the more powerful, he's the older brother. And then some were saying Krishna. And then Prabhupada said, well, see, Balaram has his hand on Krishna's shoulder, so Krishna's holding up Balaram. So he's more powerful. And then we get to, uh, we got to the uh, mango orchard. And this time, one of Prabhupada's godbrothers, Damodar Maharaj, he was coming with us. So then Prabhupada had uh, some mats set up and he was uh, had a little portable table and he was taking prasadam with Dhamma Maharaj. He said the others could take also. We, would, we were a little off the, off the grass mat, kind of in a distance around. And then uh, sometimes uh, Prabhupada would have that type of uh, let everybody take with them picnic. So it was a uh, little picnic in the garden. And I just remember one uh, little thing is that after taking the fruit, he had, had some fruit, he gave Dhammada Maharaj some fruit. Then uh, he asked that he can serve Dhammada Maharaj water. But Dhammada Maharaj said, no, but after fruit we shouldn't drink water. And then Prabhupada said, no, but what you can do, the secret is you take a sweet. You take a sweet, then after sweet you must take water. And it doesn't, because uh, if you just take water after fruit, it washes all the nutrition of the fruit out, but if you take a sweet, he said, then that somehow caps it and you can take water after that and your fruit nutrition won't be washed away. So think that something to remember when you get thirsty after taking fruit, just take a nice Mahaprasad Sandesh or Rasagula, remember Srila Prabhupada and chant Hare Krishna. And then drink water. And then drink a little water, yeah. So that approach to eating, you know, very scientific. You know, what do you eat first? What did? So it's it's uh, not eating just to please the tongue, yeah. but eating what's required and in a way that keeps you healthy. And uh, yeah, nice. Right. I think Prabhupada would also eat uh, ginger root with every meal or yes. most yeah. meals. So these are different things that uh, he's taught us and we can share with each other. Now let's hear from Tamal Krishna Goswami about an incident that he had with Srila Prabhupada and a feast that Prabhupada uh, cooked for his spiritual master oh. regarding not eating more than required or at all. So let's listen to Tamal Krishna. Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur's, I think it was appearance day. So I told Prabhupada that Srila Prabhupada you know, can we celebrate this in the evening? Because then we'll have a lot of guests. The Prabhupada said, no. It must be celebrated at noon. So it was on a Friday. I said, Friday evening, we can fill up the temple. He said, no, it must be at noon. So we celebrated in the room, in Prabhupada's room. We, Prabhupada had a little room. This is the La Sienica Boulevard Temple, L.A. Prabhupada had a side room next to the big temple room. So... Uh, Prabhupada did all of the prayers and spoke about his Guru Maharaj. Then he said to me, how is the feast going? So I said, I'll take a look. It was about 10.30. So I went in. Nothing was done. There was no preparation. So I went back to and I said, you know, what is going on here? I started screaming at them. They said, well, you told us it was going to be Friday night. And I said, Prabhupada wanted it at noon, you know, and maybe it was my mistake. I might not have conveyed the message in any case. So I went back to Prabhupada and he said, so, how is it going? And I said, uh, there's nothing done. You know, Prabhupada just looked at me. Didn't say a word. Got up, walked through, out of his room, through the temple through the prasanam hall and into the kitchen. He immediately got 
told the devotees, get this done, get this done, cut this vegetable, with this. He cooked a feast in one hour for at least 70 devotees, personally cooked the whole feast, at least 12 preparations within one hour's time. And he always told me, I always remember this, Prabhupada always said, deity worship is one hour's business, cooking is one hour's business. Cooked the whole feast in one hour. And I remember one of the best things I remember about it was the way Prabhupada made the puris that day. Because every puri puffed up. He put in the puri in the hot ghee, you know, and he would just touch it. And it was like he would touch them. He would, I remember they would blow a little and he would touch them, even sometimes with his finger. And it just perfect puris. Then the feast was offered and it was brought out of Prabhupada's room after it was given to Prabhupada, the whole maha plate. Within about three minutes afterwards, it came out practically untouched. And we were all eating this big feast and we saw Prabhupada didn't eat and everybody went, oh. Prabhupada was very upset. But he still cooked the whole feast for his Guru Maharaj. He was determined that it must be, and he told him it must be offered by 12. But he was very disturbed. Yeah, boy. The, 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 the mood of, of the role of food as an offering and the honoring of that food also as an offering. And, um, you know, that's, that's, that's I think, the essence of, of this uh, quality of a Vaishnava. Yeah, it also reminds me of, Prabhupada mentioned, I think we spoke about this before, how when the digestive juices in the stomach call out and urge you to eat you get hungry then yes. you need to satisfy that right away but in this case it's kind of like the opposite where his consciousness and his mental state was disturbed by not having the devotees prepare properly where he had to take over you know and do it all himself i'm yeah. sure he yeah. you know, obviously did it out of love but that's not what his initial intention was yes yeah. and because of that and I'm speculating maybe, but with that mental disturbance, he, you know, he was not required, it was not required for him to eat. Yeah, not required. Yeah. It would have, uh, you know, yeah. upset yeah. him even more, maybe physically, if uh, he ate at that time. Mm. So, Ray Bhatti Nandan tells another story. All these devotees had a lot of personal association with Prabhupada, so we take advantage of uh, their stories. And this particular story he tells, he explains what Srila Prabhupada told him about eating offered food stuff to Krishna and this requirement about offering. Yes. Okay. So let's listen That's... to Ray Bhatti Nandan. While we were walking back one time, I remember I, I asked Srila Prabhupada as we were walking side by side, I said, Srila Prabhupada, could I ask you this? This is not a judgmental question because whatever you eat, I'll eat with you and feel like it's what I should be eating and it's maha prasadam for me. But I don't think that the food that we're getting fed here is really being offered to Krishna. They have a Krishna deity in there but you can't tell him from the other deities and they don't make any discrimination. And uh, how should we view eating like this? And Prabhupada looked at me and he said, um, now I'm putting this out now because I feel like some of these things at least they should be on record, even though, well, I'll tell you what happened. He said, actually, he said, everything is prasadam. And so a Vaishnav, if he takes anything, he simply takes it as the mercy of the Lord. Right? But um, uh, we prefer to eat what is offered to Radha and Krishna. But otherwise, we understand everything to be the mercy of Krishna. He said, but do not preach like this, he said. And I said, why is that? And he said, because the new devotees, they, 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 they will take food simply as sense enjoyment unless they offer it first. And so we did not want to confuse them. And that, as I thought about it, I was smiling on the way back because I always thought that's the difference between how an Uttama Adhikari sees things and when he comes down to the level of a Madhya Adhikari to preach. It was the first time I saw a clear-cut example of that, which I saw many times later on. Is, as I saw how Prabhupada had his priorities and like that, but that was the first time. That is quite a significant uh, demonstration of Srila Prabhupada's relationship with food. All food to him was Krishna's prasadam. Right. So it's compassionate and a clear understanding of the philosophy and yeah. that distinction between Uttama 
and Ahmad Jamad Akari and the way, you know, we're there for preach. So Prabhupada was giving the absolute truth to him, but, you know, qualified that by saying, don't preach this when I'm just yes, telling you. Yeah, certainly <laughs> new to people like me. Who was, oh, yeah, okay. This is, this is the absolute standard. <laughs> Let's but, go for uh, it. Yeah. But qualified it so that uh, the young, younger yeah. new devotees would not be confused and yeah. neglect to offer with love and devotion. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, we have uh, Shruti Rupa, who had this a uh, good deal of experience with Prabhupada. Well, again, tell us an anecdote that she experienced where she describes what Srila Prabhupada required when his body was failing him. Mm -hmm. And so this falls in that platform of what's required in that mm -hmm. circumstance. And at that time, Prabhupada hadn't come out to Darshan. I hadn't seen Prabhupada in two weeks physically, and he hadn't eaten anything. You know, that you could count in the palm of your hand in that amount of time. And when I walked in, um, it was a bit of a shock. He didn't have his kurta on. He, he had a, a top piece, and he was sitting, and he had his knee up, and he was doting over his knee, so his knee was showing. And his collarbone was jutting out. He was so thin. He was so thin. And it immediately put me in a space when I saw him. And... I, I, um, I went up, but I couldn't hear his voice. His voice was very weak. So I moved a little closer. I couldn't hear him. I had, I, came, I had to come maybe five inches from his face to hear his voice. And I was right into his face. And he looked at me and he said, I have not eaten anything solid for two weeks. And I started to cry. The tears started to come down my face. And he saw that and he looked at me and he said, but... I'm eating this thing, Gada. <laughs> and everybody roared. There was Tukamal Krishna Maharaj, there was um, Bhakti Charu, and uh, Upendra. Upendra was there. And uh, everybody roared and said, Jai Prabhupada. And so then he said, I, But I'm eating this cigar. And I started to smile. And he looked at me and he said, So you can cook. <laughs> and so I, I sat back and uh, on my knee, I, I sat back from him and he said, uh, he said, but, he said, but, and he became a little stern. And he said, but, he said, you must shop, you must cook, and you must clean. And he said, and you must have no assistance. It was very firm. And then his voice softened and he said, is that all right? I smiled and I said, of course, Srila Prabhupada. And then he looked around at the men and he said, and no men are to be in the kitchen when she is there. And, and then he looked at Abhiram and he said, if you need assistance, your husband can do. And he left it like that. Hmm. Singara, it's a singara. I, I, I... I was listening, and that must that's we most devotees will uh, recognize as samosa, but uh, in Bengal it's singara is uh, yeah, and it's distinguished, I think, between us uh, against a samosa by that having a thinner, flakier crust. Yes, that could be. That could be. Yes, and a, and yes. A traditional yeah. samosa, Bengali style. Bengal, absolutely, <laughs> that's right. But that's amazing. Yeah, yeah, and and you know just. The way he engaged us in the, the the service of preparing and cooking and yeah, serving and, him that way, and what was what was required in this situation was that only he probably out only wanted her in the kitchen cooking. It. Yeah, yeah. Whereas I mean, previously, when he was healthier, then you know there were multiple devotees in there, yeah, preparing everything, etc. But the, he only wanted her. Her vibe, her consciousness. Yes, yes. So that's what was required at that time. Yeah. Now let's hear again from Tamal Krishna Goswami, who is going to tell us another situation where, in that same setting where Prabhupada was ill and what was required at that time. Mm. Let's listen to Tamal Krishna Goswami. When we got to Rishikesh, Prabhupada was ill. And uh, we were staying in this house, Ganga Darshan. 
very nice house, right overlooking the Ganga. Prabhupada had been lured there by uh, Nava Yogendra Swami, who told him, if you drink water, I think it was he who lured, if you drink water there, you'll get back your health. So as soon as we got there, Prabhupada told me, bring Ganga Jal. And I immediately put on my gumption, I dove off the second story of the building, because it was overlooking the Ganga, and I dove into the Ganga from the second floor. Prabhupada was getting his massage, and I went out with a loda and came back, swam back with the loda, brought up, and Prabhupada, right in the middle of the, you know, and he was not eating well at those time, this time, it was the last months. He immediately took a full, you know, glass of water, and a big belch came out afterwards, and Prabhupada said, ah, accept it. And he smiled, and he was very pleased with that. I was sitting, standing there dripping wet, and he accepted. So then he immediately ordered, go out and get kachoris, kachoris and jalebis. There was one shop very famous for making jalebis and kachoris in Rishikesh. And Prabhupada said, this hot jalebis is a remedy, cure, for a sore throat. He said, now it is a little cold, we must get hot jalebis. So we ate hot jalebis, and he said, this is, whenever you have sore throat, you eat hot jalebis. But must be made fresh hot. And another time, Prabhupada gave me the cure for, it was a very nice cure, isn't it? Jalebis, if they're made you know, nicely, are so tasty, and that's how you get better. Another cure he gave me was when you have dysentery. Hot puris and salt. The puris must be cooked in ghee. They must be right off the fire with salt. And sure enough, I had this dysentery. I took hot puris and salt, immediately cured, like a cork. Yes, required for health. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's not just for quantity filling up the belly, but yeah. Uh, yeah. medicinal purposes and making mm -hmm. sure the body is working and functioning properly. Mm -hmm. So everyone take note of those cures for those particular diseases, especially when you go to India. It's not always available. Hot, good hot jalebi is not here. <laughs> or <laughs> cooking puris for salt. Maybe not. Yeah. But that is uh, the panacea for that. Yeah. All right. Last one we're going to hear from Sarva Mangala Dasi, uh, who reflects not just on the notion of quantity that Srila Prabhupada ate at any one time, but more importantly, as to what she observed of him as to what is required when honoring Prashadam. Mm. So let's focus okay. on, I think, consciousness in this regard. I don't want to give it away, but let's look for that instruction. Okay. Well, Prabhupada was so humorous, which was uh, wonderful, <laughs> but it, also his sobriety. When he used to sit down to have his, uh, his meal, I, I only served him his breakfast, but he, was, uh, he sat down so simply at this little choky in his bedroom, right against the wall, and just so sober and so honoring, just really demonstrating how you honor Prashanam. And not talking to anybody, and just, you know, taking a little of this, taking a little of that. It was like so meditative. And, you know, it was only that one time I think he called me. Um, it was so beautiful to see. I always think Prabhupada was like, poetry in motion. <laughs> Everything he did was just like um, like in the spiritual world, every, every step's a dance. The way he moved and uh, he was always demonstrating complete presence to Krishna, whatever he was doing, everything he did was beautiful, as if it was an act of love. Yes, yes, this relationship Srila Prabhupada had with Prashadam. Not, uh, I think this, this quality of a devotee in, in their relationship with, with eating is uh, demonstrated in so many, like we, what, what we've seen today, so many different uh, dimensions and aspects of it, from the preparation and the quantity and the, the circumstances and the health. And, uh, and here, this, the, the, uh, spiritual relationship. Yeah, and the the notion that he was quiet and meditative, where sometimes you know we as 
devotees will eat in a prasadam hall or in a temple room with a bunch of devotees yeah. around us and we end up talking yeah. i don't know maybe not but just for chalpa but some other things where it takes yeah. us away from meditating on honoring the prasadam yeah not and, the power lunch <laughs> concept you know <laughs> yeah eat and run no yeah, eat and run yeah. that's not on the, the go All right <laughs> So anyway, that's the uh, the lessons and stories we have for this Akadashi. Wonderful. Wonderful. Next, next Akadashi, we're going to have quality number 18, which is the, a Vaishnava, a perfect gentleman, is not influenced by the Lord's illusory energy. Um, so some stories to look forward to. Good. good. Jai Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Hare Krishna. 